All right, folks, welcome to another Big Buck Blueprint podcast. This is Jackie Bushman of the Buckmasters, and I got a special guest today. He is the Buckmaster himself from Ohio, and this is Coben Vince. Coben, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Jackie. Well, talk to me a little bit. I've been hunting Ohio over the years. I've hunted Central Ohio. They're out of Newark with uh, my buddy Ty McCombs, Whitetail Outfitters, Ohio. I've hunted there for a while. And I was just always was amazed at the size of the white tents. Unbelievable yeah. up there in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. They grow them big. I mean, with all the egg fields running around, um, they can run around to eat. And you know, we always have a good acorn crop. So um, they have plenty to eat, to eat throughout the season, um, especially leading up to while they're, they're growing their velvet. And I mean, they grow big here. That's for sure. All right. When did you get started hunting? So I, as a kid, I always grew up um, bird hunting, you know, running around with BB guns and um, riding bikes around. And I, I grew up in a small town, so kind of started there, um, got out of it as I was going through school, playing sports, played college football. Um, and then once I was done with college, um, I met my wife, my now wife, and we've been together for about 12 years. And her, um, her father and her brother are big hunters. So that kind of got me back into things. She bought me my first bow. She bought me um, a shotgun. She's bought me quite a few firearms and, and toys over the years. So I got pretty dedicated back into it about 12 years ago, I'd say. What would you say is your favorite weapon up there? I Honestly, I love a, a good old uh, compound bow. I bought a new uh, Matthews V3X this year. Um, so I'm itching to get, get something with that. Um, luckily this year I was able to harvest, you know, the buck I did with the rifle, but I really enjoy archery hunting, getting close to the animals, um, kind of learning their patterns, learning, learning about the animal itself. And, um, I just feel like archery hunting makes you a better hunter because you got to get close up close and personal to, to the animal that you're, you're going after. No question about that. I have to use all weapons, but I will, I will like the bow a little bit more. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is this particular buck something you chase for a while? Yeah. So I want to say I saw him once last year. I don't run a ton of cameras. I do have some cameras where I hunt, but not a ton. And I saw a, a really big, what I guess was 12 point, about 70 yards when I was archery hunting last year, um, 70 yards from a huge frame. And I want to say it was this deer because um, the deer, the, the quality deer I had running around, um, I think with the growth he would have put on from last year, if it is the same deer to this year, it lines up, um, because the biggest deer I have running around is not to the quality of what the one I saw last year. Uh, but then, you know, let's fast forward to this year. I first saw him. So Ohio has their rifle, um, firearm season. So shotgun or rifle, um, the week after Thanksgiving, I actually saw him coming home from dinner with my family around nine o'clock at night. It was pitch black out um not far from where i hunt and uh he ran across the road was chasing a doe right in front of us um so then i end up seeing him at least two times during that that firearm week here in ohio and then um we have the extended firearm week the extended weekend in the middle of december so that's when i was able to capitalize on him but between the firearm week and when i finally got him I had four or five different encounters with him while I was archery hunting. Um, I was able to kind of learn his pattern, learn what he likes to do, where he likes to exit the field and enter the field in the morning. Um, but though it was predictable, he was still unpredictable at the same time. But, you know, this aged deer, he's not going to utilize the same, you know, path he's going to walk in every time. Um, so I was able to move my stand four or five different times be before I was able to capitalize on him. Um, and even that morning we can get into it more, but I, I had to put a move on them, um, and climb out of my stand to actually get within gun range to harvest them. Um, but yeah, so four or five times, unfortunately, I don't have any camera photos of them, which would have been cool right where I had my camera at, where he had the woods absolutely shredded up. I, I didn't check it before, um, before that extended gun season and it died in August. It died like two weeks after I put it out. I forgot the forgot to wipe the SD memory card and then the batteries were shot. So I don't have any good pictures of them, unfortunately, but I did get a lot of um, on hoof sightings of them. Now food sources talk about what, you know, let's talk about the strategy of him because, you know, between food source, tree stand, 
you know, location, wind direction, trail cameras, what was going through? Because every big deer has to have a setup, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yep. what was kind of going through the whole motion right there? Food sources yeah. and everything. Yeah. Once they pulled the crops was when I started getting some, some sightings of them. And that what that kind of lined up with when I saw him, you know, that driving home from dinner. Um, but I think he was living in corn. Um, we always have a, like I said, a nice crop of, of, um, of acorns that he's able to, um, browse on. And then the, the wood sets up for him to be able to browse, um, and not really have to hunt for food, honestly, in the woods that I, that I hunt. So I'm blessed in that, that we, I have egg, I got acorns and I good, I got, I have the good, the good browsing food throughout the woods. Um, so with those lining up, really what I, what I do is, um, the main thing is the wind, but I've learned over the years, if you don't have the wind, especially when you're hunting big quality deer, if you don't have the wind in your favor, you're going to, you're going to be, um, have a long sit ahead of you. Um, so I always play the wind. Um, and the other thing is just what I'm seeing, um, as far as sign, what, what, what I'm seeing is rubs and scrapes and kind of just trying to put a game plan together based on where's the wind, where am I seeing the most frequent sign? How fresh is that sign? Um, and then I, I kind of put a game plan together um, as I go. I got you. I mean, what type of acreage are you talking about on this deer? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know he has a, a good couple mile um, radius that he likes wow. to, yeah, that he likes to um, like to patrol because I had a couple hunters reach out to me um, who were, are local um, and had, they pinpointed exactly where I hunted. So I know, and they've had sightings and trail camera photos of them and, you know, putting that on the Onyx map. I mean, it looks like he has a good two or three mile um, radius that he likes to live on. I hunt um, a little over 300 acres myself um, that I, that I saw him frequent, you know, I mean, it never went more than one or two days without seeing him while I was actively pursuing him. That's cool. Because you're yeah. right. The wind and pressure are seen mm -hmm. to be the two biggest things when you're chasing yeah. the big ones. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's hard to give up a day's hunt when the wind's wrong. It's the hardest mm -hmm. thing for people to do. So I've always said, try to have as many alternative ways of getting in without spooking them. But if you just got the wrong wind, you, you got to sit out or, or he's going to yeah. be taking that other two mile route and it ain't going to mm -hmm. be on yours. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I have a lone wolf, um, hang on set that I carry back, um, all my back, every hunt, whether or not I'm hunting this property or a different property. I always, that's what I hunt out of primarily. I don't have, um, very many set stands. I do have my in-laws. He has quite a few set stands, but I like to, um, I like to run and gun kind of, and kind of play with the sign I'm seeing, what the wind's looking like. Um, and then again, like you said, pressure is the biggest thing, not letting these big deer know that they're being pressured and they're being hunted, being smart yet aggressive is that's the hard thing. That's what it took me years to figure that out, smart and aggressive and how I can go about, um, capitalizing on these deer from year to year. You know, it's funny. Cause I, I had a man that took me to a side and, um, we were all picking our stands, you know, the, say on Friday nights for Saturday. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy never picked his stand till Saturday morning. And I never did understand that. Yeah. And yeah. Sometimes I get lucky. Sometimes I would, but I never understood it. And he finally took me to the side and said, Hey, I see you really want to be good at this sport, but you're getting your butt kicked right now. He said, mm -hmm. I don't go to a stand until I know what the wind direction is. Mm -hmm. And once I figured that out, he said, Hey, you can do all you want. You can buy all the clothes and the scent and all that. And if you don't pay attention to the wind, you're wasting your time out here. Yeah, and once absolutely. I learned that it was like game on and, mm -hmm. and it's true. Just listening to you from Ohio and me from Alabama, it's a wind game because mm -hmm. the smartest thing on a whitetail is her nose. Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like you figured that deal out up there. And, and that's the key. I mean, you were able to, now, how many times were you seeing this deer more in the mornings on or, or afternoons or a little bit of both? Mostly in the evenings. Honestly, I did. I had two encounters with him in the mornings. A lot of times I'm seeing him in the evenings because he was actively working does to the point the morning I shot him, he was still on does. And that's mid-December yeah. in Ohio, which is late for them to be hitting does. Mm -hmm. um, but he was he was always coming out evening is when i was i was getting the most sightings when he's on the does figuring out kind of their patterns as well that's why i like the archery thing because you're figuring out the deer and what they like to do and you really got to be 
um, up close and personal to get it shot when you're, when you're archery hunting. So, um, just kind of learning the woods, learning, you know, that I've been hunting this woods for a handful of years. Now I feel like I finally got under my belt. I kind of know what the deer, um, what their movement patterns are. Um, so that helped me be able to, you know, what are the does doing? He's going to be, he's going to be near them. Um, but like I said, a lot of times in the evenings is when I see them when they come out to feed. I got you. Now let's yeah. talk about, uh, your weapon because right. It's not a rifle. It's a, it's a particular type of weapon you can use. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So in Ohio, they, um, I want to say five or six years ago, they passed, it might've been a little bit longer than that, but they passed where you can rifle hunt with a straight wall cartridge. Right. Um, so prior to that, it was only shotgun, you know, whether you have a smooth bore or rifle, it didn't matter, but you can only shoot with, um, shoot a deer with a slug, um, from a, a shotgun. So they, they finally passed where you could hunt in Ohio with a straight wall cartridge so that I specifically hunt, um, with a 450 Bushmaster or Ruger 450 Bushmaster. Um, I think it's the American model. Um, and that's what I harvested this particular deer with. Um, and I've harvested a couple of does with it as well, but I've only owned it for two or three years. So, mm -hmm. um, don't have a lot of time behind it, but what's your range on that? You can, so with the 450, it's such a big bullet. Um, it's hard to get 200 yards here where I, where I live to sight in. They recommend sighting it out 200 yards because then you have, um, it'll hit a little bit high at like a hundred and then, but you'll start to see the bullet drop drastically after 200 yards. I have mine sighted in at a hundred yards. So, um, I think it's when, when it's from a hundred yards to 200 yards, it drops about nine inches because of the size of the bullet. Mm -hmm. So you really got to play that, um, into consideration when you're take, taking those longer shots on, on these animals here, um, in this particular state, because it's not going to, it doesn't have a flat trajectory like you would you'd see with a, um, you know, five, five, six round or something like that. I got you. Now, are you hunting up in the hills and the ridges? That's kind of where I was. Are you more flat land? Yeah. So where I'm at, it's more, um, agriculture fields. It's fairly, I mean, you got some rolls here and there, but it's fairly flat. Um, now drive 30 minutes to where I grew up hunting with my, um, uh, when I went, once I met my wife, it's, it's very hilly in that part of Licking County. Um, mm -hmm. but, yeah, I mean, where I hunt, it's mostly egg fields, some rolls here and there. So you're able to play those to your advantage when you're accessing your your stand location. Um, but as far as really, really um, hilly and a lot of terrain differences, there's not much here. I got you. I got you. Yeah. What's your, uh, is it corn or soybeans? What's the, what's the big crop up there? Well, they alternate. Um, so this year was corn. We're out near where I hunt on one side of the property. The other side of the property was um soybeans i personally like i think i like the corn more because it holds the deer i feel like they live in those egg fields at least from my experience where i'm hunting at so i feel like i'm able to get a, a longer um a longer period that i can hunt them because they're sticking around for a longer period of time i feel like when i got the soybeans around me um you'll see them feeding all the time but once they they uh turn brown they're they're on to a new food source where in the corn i feel like they're hanging around until it gets pulled do they cut the corn uh in october or november when do they normally cut it it real honestly it depends on what the weather's looking like and how much rain we get this year right. it was pretty late it was so i took a south uh trip out trip out to south dakota to pheasant and waterfowl hunt um early october or late october i mean and got back first week of november and they were just taking the egg fields off when I got back. Folks, today's podcast is brought to you by Phoenix Lighting. Check out the new lights. This is the HT32. Four modes. One, two, three, and four. Extremely bright, up to 2,500 lumens. It also goes out to a distance of 700 yards, available in red and green modes. Check out the link in the description. You know, it's funny, I was hunting Wisconsin and we were hunting big ridges similar to Ohio and we hunted for a week and I never forget we were eating lunch and I could see the cornfield right there and the guy was picking the corn mm -hmm. and there must have been a dozen bucks that come out of that corn. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've never seen that before. I'm sitting there going, we're hunting the woods and these deer are bedding up right in this corn. They're not leaving the corn, oh. they're eating, they got water in the corn. It's like, okay, I got this now. I understand mm -hmm. it. So 
I get what you're talking about. So if they hadn't cut that corn, you were just waiting for that because that way they got them yeah. out of the corn and you could pattern them a little bit better. Yep. That's it. I mean, when I was out in South Dakota, I was out there for seven days and I was constantly talking to my wife, Hey, did they pulled that corn. Yeah. They pulled that corn. Yeah. And it was like, I'm not going to bug the farmer asking when he's, when he's pulling it, but I hope he gets on it. I mean, like you said, cause they, they stick in there and, I mean, it's, I've seen videos like Cody DeQuisto, like, I mean, he's an amazing hunter and I've seen him harvest big bucks out of corn, but it's darn near impossible, especially, yeah. I mean, you don't get much of a range for a shot. So exactly. Well, yeah. let's talk about this hunt, set it up a little bit. Let's talk about the particular day, morning, afternoon. Let's, let's just go right into it and tell me what your thought pattern was. Yeah. So um, like I said, I harvested this deer on the extended gun weekend. I forget the dates. I think it was like 15th or 16th now. Um, I actually saw the deer Thursday night. Um, so I was kind of actively scouting. Like I said, I have a lone wolf that I, I don't typically hunt the same tree, um, time after time. Um, so I was actively scouting when I was going back Thursday night, that was still during archery season. Um, and I found a very, very active scrape. So I set up on that. Then I saw him come out Thursday night. He was nowhere close to me, but I watched him come out with a bunch of does. So I was like, all right, I'm not gonna be able to hunt Friday. So I'm going to keep my stand here because this scrape is being hit pretty hard. I mean, um, it was, it was fresh and we mm. hadn't had much rain. So the, the dirt being that, that dark color, I knew they'd been actively rubbing it. So I kept my stand there, um, got up super early Friday or Saturday morning and got in the stand at least 45 minutes to an hour before um, active shooting. Like, so in Ohio, you can you can shoot a half hour before the official sunrise. Um, so I forget when sunrise, that might've been like 7.30 or something like that. Um, it was just starting to get light out. I just heard, heard my first gunshot. So I knew it was, you know, I, I, was, I was checking my phone, but I knew it, it was game on. So I was kind of looking around, I was hoping what I knew what he typically did was he would come out of the woods, um, hang around in this pastured area and then with the does, and then they'd slowly work their way into the cut corn and start feeding through the cut corn. So I, I was hoping that the route I took into the woods that morning, that perhaps he was doing, he was feeding the, the egg fields and I could catch him when he was coming back into bed. So I was looking around, um, ended up looking behind me and about, 216 yards i believe is what i range find um i saw a couple deer coming from this major corn or this major egg field cut corn field into the smaller section where i had a visual on so i saw uh i think it was three or four deer um i could tell two of them were antlered so i um, put my binos up and i immediately knew the one one of the bucks was him so i you know was putting my game plan together like what am i going to do if he does this and does that. So the two scenarios I played out in my head while I'm sitting there watching 216 yards away was he's either going to come to me and work this scrape. Cause I've seen him work a scrape. I didn't know exactly where the scrape was because I was hunting the other side of the property one during gun week um, in November, but I knew there was a scrape over there. And I think I was set up on the one he was hunt. He had, had hit that one time when I was hunting. So I figured he's coming to me um, and I'll obviously get a shot if he comes to me. Or he's going to do what I saw him do Thursday night and go to that portion of the, the field and that portion of the pasture area and then slowly work his way into the woods. And by that time, I started to notice that there were some does funneling out of that section um, into that pasture area um, coming from the block of woods. So as I, I if he goes over there, I'm going to climb down. I'm going to try to cut the distance and get a shot on him. So um, what... He, I end up watching him. Of course, he didn't make a decision right away. He just walks the straight, the same row he was walking until he got to about, I'd say 190 yards out. And then he started to veer off to his left, which is, was away from me at that point in time. Um, so I immediately threw my rifle on my back. Usually I, I'm real smart about using my lineman's rope and being safe, getting down, but I just got down as fast as I could. Um, you know, kept a visual on the deer the best I could as I was climbing down, trying to make as little noise as possible. And he's, he's working his way. He's not feeding while he's walking. He's walking to where he saw the deer come, the does come out of. So he's not being slow about it. So I finally get down, um, start, luckily there was a knoll going all the way through the cornfield. So while I'm on the ground working my way through the woods, 
I could see his antlers, but I couldn't see his eyes. So I knew there was no way, as long as I wasn't being super loud, that he was going to be able to bust me um, because he couldn't get a visual on me. So I worked my way through the woods as he's working his way to the does. And I had to kind of loop around the way that, because I didn't want to walk through the corn. I didn't want to walk through the cut corn. I wanted to stay, make sure I was staying in the field uh, or not the field, the, the woods. So I got to where I guessed was about 160 yards to where I knew he was going to end up. Um, but at that point in time, I didn't have a visual on him. I'd say three or four minutes had passed um, by that point in time. So I kind of, I knew I could pop out there. I knew I had a clear shot because I, I had an area to pop out of. And I, just thinking through my head from how I know the woods to lay out, I was like, I don't know if I have another opening where I can get out. So I'm just going to have to do it now. And I think it's about 160 yards. So I work my way towards the edge of the woods, get my binos up and see he's um, getting towards the doe, but he's looking back at me. So obviously I'm walking as fast and as quick as possible. There's a bunch of deadfall. So I must've been noisier than I thought I was being. He's looking back in my direction. Finally came to the conclusion that he didn't think anything was there. So as soon as he turned his head, I crept out into the opening. All the does are staring right at me. Um, you know, I was kind of crawling on my knees. So I propped one knee up, put my elbow on that knee. Um, and the thing I didn't, I forgot to tell Toby Hughes, but I did tell, I had an interview with, um, with a lady from the Buckmaster magazine. And I remember to tell her this, hold the trigger. And there's just a click. But I think what happened was when I set my bolt as quietly as I could that morning, I didn't fully seed it. Oh. So I was oh crap. So I hurried up, injected that round put another round in um got like i said i didn't have time to range find him i guess it was probably about 160 yards so i put the shot on him i didn't buckle him but i could tell i hit him he he felt it so he kind of you know jumped up curled up did the mule kick hopped about 20 yards and just stood there with his butt facing to me so there's no way to put a follow-up shot on him i watched him for about a minute through my rifle scope and I was like, okay, well, maybe I didn't put a, as good of a shot on him as I thought, you know, running through the woods, heart rates pumping, staring at the mass, the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. Um, and then I obviously have to eject around, put a new round in. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get back in the woods. I'm going to hit this path that I know about, um, work my way to him. So I get back, I'm hitting that path, trying to figure out where he's at. I finally make visual with him. He's I'm probably about 30 yards behind him, but a hundred yards into the woods. Um, so I'm watching him. And then, so I so, slowly start creeping towards him, making sure there's trees between me and him. So he can't get a visual on me at all. Um, as I'm doing that, I watch him lay down. So I, you know, say a couple prayers, thank God for the opportunity to potentially harvest this deer. But again, in the back of my head, I'm thinking maybe I didn't put a good shot on him. So I'm, I need to be ready for a follow-up shot just in the event that, he, he didn't, he didn't die right there. So I give it another two or three minutes. Um, I watch him lay his head down. So I'm like, hope, you know, hopefully he's expiring, but if not, I need to be ready. So I only walk, work my way to the opening. As soon as I hit the opening in that field or that pasture area, he jumps up, um, starts to trot towards the woods. Um, his leg was broke. Um, so luckily he wasn't able to get going full steam. And he was, I put, put another shot on him right through the, the lungs at like 60 yards and he, he toppled over there. So I head back into the woods, um, call my wife, let her know what happened. Um, said, I'm going to give him time just because this is a freak deer. I don't want to do anything silly. I want to make sure that he has time to expire. I don't want to have to put another shot on him. So I gave it a while um, before I looped back around. I looped in front of him this time because he was about 15 yards from the opening of the woods. I was like, if somehow he didn't, if he survived that shot, I want to make him turn around and run back the other way a hundred yards before he can get the cover rather than just hitting those woods right in front of me. So I looped around him, put my binos up on him and uh, his tongue was hanging out. So I knew he was expired by that point in time. So I was able to finally get up close and personal to him is, I mean, I knew he was big, but I'd never seen him closer than 160 yards. So I was just astounded when I, I when I walked up to him just it was crazy so well you know super cool experience that's a crazy story I mean most yeah. people are sitting in tree stands and haven't come by doing this you yeah. literally got out of your tree stand and you're spotting and stalking this buck with the wind mm -hmm. right hoping does and everything's not seeing you and blowing him out of there yeah and 
you you pulled it off. I mean, yeah, you're, was, you're the Houdini, man. Yeah, it played out because the funny thing about that is um, I got two points I want to make. The first point, um, I've been um, I'm pretty close with my brother-in-law. He's a huge hunter. He texted me at 5:30 that morning. He said, "Hey, send me a picture of that buck once you kill him," because he knew I'd been playing, you know, playing chess with that buck all season, mm-hmm. and he had a feeling that it was going to happen that morning. So that was a cool experience too. I was able to text him say he's down. My brother-in-law was hunting on a different property about 30 minutes away. He climbed right down out of his tree stand and head straight over because he wanted to see see in person this buck because I'd only had vis- you know videos of it through my binoculars with the cell phone. So he wanted to see it in person too. Um, but the cool thing about the way I had to go about um, killing that deer um, was almost you know like an elk hunt, an out west elk hunt where you had to put a move mm-hmm. on him. My six-year-old son had been calling that deer ever since we saw him that that night running across the road, the elk deer. So that was kind of cool that it kind of came yeah. full circle that I had to put an out west type maneuver on him. Well, congratulations. And like I said, yeah, I always tell everybody, you won one World Series. If you never yeah. get another one, you can't take that one away from you. I know. And, I know. And, I was, and you did well. I was but hoping I, just to sh- Go ahead, you got, go ahead, you got a lot of deer up there that, hey, that's the cool thing about Ohio is you mm-hmm. just shot a 218-inch deer. There are just as many big deer coming up behind that. So you're yeah. blessed to be in a place like that. Yeah, Ohio had a really good year. I mean, I had obviously my luck here shooting that, that deer. But, I mean, if you look across the board, there's quite a few 200-inch deer and just absolute monsters that were taken in Ohio. So it's, it's slowly creeping up to one of those states that are, you know, it's putting people on notice. It's not the... You know, you don't have to drive off to Iowa to get these big deer. Ohio has some big deer here right at home. No question. Well, yeah. talk about old Toby. Uh, Toby's one of our master scorers and uh, glad to have him. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure he was excited to know he got an opportunity to score one magnificent buck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Toby and Lori are absolutely amazing people. Um, you know, at no point in time did you feel uncomfortable being in their house. I mean, they made you feel right at home like you've known them for 20 years. So, um, you know, moving forward, Toby's going to be the guy to go to for me. And I, I've already put a couple people, um, in his direction. I was like, you know, this guy knows what he's doing. He takes his time with the deer. Um, I, I got there and he was still working on somebody else's deer. And he, even though I was there with the quality deer I have, um, the ladies whose deer he was measuring, I mean, she had a quality 170 inch deer. He did, he made sure he dedicated that time. She had her appointment. So he didn't rush through things to get to my deer. So I was cool just watching him work on somebody else's too, that he's, everyone is treated the same when you go to him. Uh, yeah. And then obviously his knowledge and the amount of deer he's measured. And, you know, he, t- he taught me a couple of things about, about my deer that I didn't know about. They had, um, you know, a couple um, areas on here. I didn't know about like that. These are from the flies and hit, hit him hitting as he's walking through the cornfield. So Toby's very knowledgeable. Um, I couldn't recommend it more to anybody in the state yeah. of Ohio or, you know, neighboring states. Well, had you ever heard about the BTR scoring system until you heard Toby? Have you a heard little about bit, it over the years? Yeah. A little bit. Um, just from some of the Facebook pages I follow, mm-hmm. people talking about it, but I never really dove into it too much. Um, and then once I shot my deer, had it measured by Toby and certain started looking at the differences between, uh, the BTR scoring system. And then you got obviously Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, those types of scoring systems. I really like the the fact that you get credit um, for Buckmasters for the inches that that deer grew. You're not going to get penalized because it's unsymmetrical or because you had six points on this side, five points on that side. The ones on, on one side were two inches longer than the other one. I mean, I'm going to probably get this deer measured by Boone and Crockett just to see what how it shapes up. But the fact that I'm looking at all these deductions um kind of disappoints me but at the same time i'm still blessed enough to be able to shoot this quality of a deer well that's the reason we started the scoring system i mean Ben and crock and pope and young i mean they've been around i mean they're still gonna keep doing their thing but we always just thought it would be a great alternative because there's so many deer that mm-hmm. got left out of the record book because it's all based on perfect symmetry and mm-hmm. we're saying what the good lord gave that deer is what he should be scoring so mm-hmm. we've got over, I think, 18,000 entries now just because of a lot of deer that would have never made the other record books got a chance to be recognized. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that's that. Uh, ben and Crocker and Pope Young, uh, those guys are friends of ours. They're going to keep doing their thing. They're wonderful. But we just got an alternative scoring system that gives a lot of deer a chance to have more credibility out there. Yeah, absolutely. 
Hold that thing up. I don't know if you can take yeah. up the whole frame or what. Yeah, I'll push this back over here. Golly. I mean, I, I'm a spread guy. I love yeah. a 20-plus inch spread. Look at that thing right there. Yep. Isn't that awesome? Hey, you going to full body outside. size mount him? Uh, if my wife would let me, I would. But she's she lets me mount all my deer. I try to shoot quality size deer. So she, luckily enough, she lets me shoulder mount all my deer. But um, I don't think she has an area where I can put a nice pedestal mount up. But, yeah, he'll be going. I mean, I have a couple of deer up here right now. So wow, we'll keep, keep it going here. That is so cool. Yeah. How many bucks have you taken in your career so far? This – so I went – at my father-in-law's house, I didn't shoot one uh, for the first four years because I wanted my first deer to be a good quality deer. I was uh, not like I started to hunt when I was 12 years old and just trying to take a spike. I started hunting when I was 21, 22 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 33 now. Um, so I, I figured, you know, let's make it a quality deer. So my first deer um, was about 135, 140 inches. Took me four years, a lot of passing of little eight point, you know, 110, 120 inch eight points before I got to that point where I was able to shoot one. Um, so this would be my fourth deer I've shot. The the previous one I've shot, the biggest one up to this point was 150 inches. That was with me measuring, not realizing, you know, you base your measurement off of where you got the most inches. So whether it's on the outside or the inside, you take your measurement off that. And Toby taught me that. So I'm starting to question, well, maybe that deer was bigger than 150 inches when I measured it, but yeah, I mean, it was, it's a really nice, um, real nice 13 point deer um, that I shot two years before I shot this one. That's awesome. So, this would be my fourth one. Yeah. Now, you can shoot what, one buck a year as a resident? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yep. One buck a year in Ohio. Yep. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. Hey, rumor has you might be on the Buckmasters magazine with that. Is that, is that a true rumor? Is that one of my Yes. Yeah so, yeah. so, my wife's a professional photographer in, in central Ohio. Um, so, she does a lot of real estate shoots, a lot of professional family shoots, that sort of thing. So, um, I don't know if you've seen my pictures floating around, but they're from her good camera and she oh. edited them and made them look real nice. So um, I did that interview with Buckmaster. I think it was Lisa, Lisa maybe, um, but I did an interview with her. She's working on the, the, um, the article right now. And then her editor got a hold of us and he wanted to put one of the, our pictures on the cover of the magazine. So we'll be on the cover either of the pre-rut or the rut magazine um, this upcoming fall. Well, that's so cool. Well, yeah. my friend, you've got a, a deer of a lifetime. And if you never shoot another one, you'll always have that one to look at. And yep. I, I'm so proud for you and I'm happy for you. And you've put in a lot of hard work and that's what it takes. That's not a buck you got by luck. Okay. Mm -hmm. You did the homework on him. You recognized where he was. But the cool thing was, my gosh, there's not many people can get down out of that tree stand and put a spot and stalk on a 200 inch deer and make it happen. So, yeah, yeah. You cool did that. That's a sure. cool story in itself. Yeah, so I appreciate it. Well, man, I appreciate you being on the podcast today. And uh, I, I definitely want to see the deer when it gets mounted. I want to see it because, boy, those yeah, horns, we'll send some photos cool. over. Yep, definitely. And I, I know you picked a special place in the house. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> she uh, we already we knew where we wanted to put it. So I was able to tell the taxidermist is how I want him to be looking and everything else. So he'll he'll lay out pretty cool with uh my, my wife's uh, decorations. Well, that is cool. Yeah. Well, all right, folks, that is right there. Kogan Vince, a 218 inch white tail from Ohio. And he did it his way. It doesn't get any better than that. And that does it for this week on the big buck blueprint podcast. I'm Jackie Bushman and we'll see you back on another podcast. Thank you, Kogan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye, right, bud.